Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on the financial and legal challenges of living with a blood cancer. My name is Mary Ann Skaparis and working with me today are my Leukaemia Foundation colleagues, Jane Anderson and Jenny Burke. Together we'll be facilitating today's webinar. First of all, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. The Leukaemia Foundation acknowledges the traditional owners of the various lands from where you are viewing today. We recognise their continuing connection to land, the sea and the community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. The impact of a blood cancer on all aspects of life cannot be underestimated. The financial impact of diagnosis on individuals and families is an emerging area of awareness in cancer care. Many people experience significant financial stress at the time of a blood cancer diagnosis. Personal and financial security can change, capacity to work can fluctuate, and accessing insurance or support payments can create uncertainty and stress. Getting your financial affairs in order also includes making a will and considering who will manage your financial affairs if you are unwell or unable to. This enables you to shift focus to your emotional and physical well-being and quality of life. Firstly, I'd like to introduce one of the speakers who is a pre-recorded speaker. Um, it's from Lee Fowler, who will outline the impact of blood cancer on her family and finances across the lifetime of her husband, Dean. Dean was newly, di was newly married at 22 with his whole life ahead of him. Six months later, he was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. He underwent many lines of treatment, relapsed, and then diagnosed with MDS. Dean lived with the complications of a bone marrow transplant until he passed away 27 years after his initial diagnosis. During their lifetime, Lee and Dean had two beautiful children, purchased a home and managed their finances throughout each of these significant life events. I suppose looking at um, financial um, um, issues throughout our journey, there were so many different avenues that we pursued. And I sort of been asked to talk about a few of those. Um, I suppose the first one I want to talk about is um, having a will, um, having um, a health directive, um, not letting people know what your expectations are for your care um, and letting your family know what your expectations are for your care. Um, I was always um, a big believer that um, you would do whatever you could to improve your health. And Dean was also um, had that train of thought as well. Um, so we always endeavoured to make sure that um, we communicated with the doctors and we everyone knew what our feelings were and which direction he wanted to go. But in saying that, um, a lot of people think having a will and life insurance and doing a health directive or advanced care directive is something that may be happening at the end. But it's really, really important to have that at the beginning of your journey so that um, if something was to happen, um, and we both had wills, we both had health directives, and we both had life insurance. So it just meant that um, if anything did happen to either of us, both of our kids would be looked after. So that was a no brainer for us. Um, so um, we both felt it was really important. Um, I mean, I could have been hit by a bus tomorrow, um, but together we've made that decision. Um, the other thing about that is um, um, it also made us feel comfortable that we that part of our journey would be taken care of. Um, and um, that if there was an issue that we were taken care of. Um, I suppose at the beginning we didn't have children, we didn't have a house, we had a car, that was about it. 
Um, so the decision in our journey to actually buy a house was actually probably more difficult than the average. Um, we knew that it was going to be a um, we knew that it was going to be quite a decision. We were very lucky and managed to find a hundred thousand dollar house um, and were able to use some um, other investments that we'd had through shares to actually purchase that property. Um, and I suppose at that point, Dean was doing really well and he was working and I was working and we both decided that even though it wasn't a huge house, it was ours. We could do with it what we liked. We could, um, you know, enjoy each other's company. Um, we could do the garden. We could, um, all those sorts of things. Um, so that decision was a no brainer again for us. Um, our biggest thing was that we just wanted to live our lives like everybody else did. Um, yes, we did miss out on a lot of things, but we still wanted to have a normal life. Um, the second decision we had was about having children. Um, and again, that's probably what something that a lot of couples don't even um, think too much about. For us, it was completely different. Um, on the day that Dean was diagnosed, we had um, uh, my mother-in-law actually commented about doing donor sperm donation. And I suppose when you're in that moment, you don't even think about what the rest of your life may look like. Um, so we took that opportunity. Um, it was hard because we were had so many other things going through our head about chemo and treatment and so forth. But long term, um, Dean's um, decision to do that was um, for the both of us. It wasn't just for him. It was for the both of us. And that's what that's what we did. So we did that donation and put that in the back burner for a while. Um, so once we bought the house and Dean um, was doing OK, we then decided to have children. And again, financially, um, a lot of people said to us, what are you doing? Like, this is, you know, it sounds terrible, but I, aren't you not just happy that Dean is still here? And yes, we were, but we still wanted to live our lives like normal people did. Like all our friends were having kids, all our, you know, or his brother had had children, so why not us? So we did. We had two, first we had Hayden. Um, and again, it wasn't financially was very difficult. Um, I wouldn't say it was easy, but um, we did it. Uh, then um, I suppose uh, things sort of settled down a little bit and then we decided to have Isabella. Um, and we got our pigeon pair and that was it. We, you know, we were good. Um, throughout this whole thing, obviously, Dean was up and down, up and down with his health. Um, and I became his uh, full-time secretary um, and had to deal with things like Centrelink, um, you know, um, all those sorts of things, his medications, his appointments. Um, and I suppose the thing with that is the fact that, as I said before, the big things like his will and his health directive were all done. They were sitting there and if we needed them, they were there. So we were just working on that on the moment and living that. Um, Centrelink, well, um, that's a really difficult um, process to go through for anybody, I can tell you. Um, but we always had this motto, it was, um, just ask. If you don't know, you don't ask. We had that with um, all of our banking institutions, um, Centrelink, um, all those sorts of things. If you are struggling, just ask. It could be that they can they can help you out. It could be that they can't, but we always made it work. It didn't matter what. Um, Centrelink, there's lots of, it's a absolutely navigating nightmare, but uh, my biggest advice on that would be to find one person that you can deal with um, and try and grab as much information off them as you possibly can. And the other thing is, is to be upright and honest um, and to um, just take 
take their advice um, and go through the process and see what the outcome come is. Look, we um, we never had a lot of money. We didn't. We struggled to pay bills. Um, I'm thankful that it's not in this day and age, but we did it. Um, and I could go into so many different things about Satellite, but um, you do have to um, be quite um, proactive in your own care, I suppose, with Centrelink and all those sorts of things. You can't expect them to do the work for you. But as I said, just ask. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, your bank, if you're struggling to pay your mortgage. Um, there was times that we would um, ask um, the electricity companies if we could just pay a small amount at a time. Um, yeah, so that that was that. Um, oh, there's so many things I could talk about, and this is really difficult. Um, but look, we um, we knew Dean's um, life was close to an end, so we decided to um, access his superannuation, um, and we accessed that probably two years ago. And when we did that, again, that was really um, a process. A uh, very stressful process, but we knew at the end we would be able to do some of the things with our family that we um, weren't able to at that stage. Um, and we knew that um, throughout Dean's life, it was always a really good idea to make sure that you were just keeping an eye on your super. Um, if you change jobs or anything like that, that you always made sure that you had a permanent disability um, pay, payout um, with your super um, and that all of his super was generating through one account. Um, so that was really important. A um, lot easier now, I think, with um, apps and things like that, but it was always really important for that. Um, we... Um, we did a lot of things um, with that super um, that we sat down and talked about. The first thing was that we bought a caravan. Um, Dean loved being out in the country and caravanning and so forth. Um, and we bought our um, dream caravan, which to some people seemed a bit silly. But again, that was an investment. That was an investment for us, um, an investment for um monetary investment but it was also investment for what we could so we could enjoy ourselves so we did lots of trips in that and um you know again you had to budget for them you had to make sure that you had the money um we didn't go too far because of dean's health but we still did it um in fact i've learned to tow a caravan and as i said to dean one time that's something i would never have done if we hadn't done that um and even sometimes if it was just a weekend away, um, an hour out of Brisbane, um, he would just love to get away. So that was one of our investments with the super. The other one was making sure that the house was, um, um, you know, livable and there was maintenance done and all those sorts of things. We did that. Um, and then we did spend a bit of it on... Um, going to New Zealand to see family and a few other things. Um, and it certainly, and making sure that both of our kids' educations were taken care of as well, um, and braces for both of them as well. So, um, yeah, I know, look, all I can really say is, um, I just think that some people probably don't feel that their financial circumstances through a diagnosis of leukemia would be great. But I do, I've always felt, and Dean was the same, that it was what you made of it um, and what you actually um, try not to take on the stresses of the, your finances. Um, if you've got someone you know that can help you out, um, 
that's always a good idea. We um, managed to get hold of a friend who was really good. He always um, kept an eye on um, our mortgage and made sure that the repayments weren't um, um, overdrawn or, you know, he just kept an eye on things. And that took the stress away from us. And he um, did that for us. And look, as a, that's what I mean. Just ask. It doesn't matter who you, who it is. If you've got a friend that's really good at saving money, say, hey, can you give me a hand to make sure that we don't, you know, end up financially in the poop because of this diagnosis? Um, and they'll, they'll help you. The Leukaemia Foundation does have a patient first strategy and I thank Lee for so generously sharing her personal story. I know I for one take away the biggest message about investment in time and how we spend time. And um, knowing Lee and her late husband, Dean, over many years, they certainly made that their, you know, they made good work of their time. They did reach out. They did ask the question. They were resourceful. Um, so ask the question. See who, who can help you out. Um, you know, see what is available to you and um, reach out to the blood cancer support coordinators too because they might be able to help guide you as well. Okay, so turning now to how we need to consider and how we might manage the, some of these issues, I would like to introduce Mr. John Beryl. John Beryl is a principal of Beryl and Watson Lawyers and is a superannuation and insurance lawyer. He is an accredited personal injury specialist. John is on the boards of the Consumer Action Law Centre and the Chronic Illness Alliance and the TAL, CBA and Suncorp Consumer Advisory Councils. He is also a volunteer at Social Security Rights Victoria and the Mental Health Legal Service. He was a member of the Financial Ombudsman Service, the Superstream Advisory Council, the Stronger Super Implementation Committee, the Natural Disaster Insurance Review Panel, and the AFCA Transition Board. You are very impressive, John. He has worked in the areas of superannuation, insurance, Centrelink, and financial services law for 28 years, providing advocacy and advice to consumers, workers, community groups, and disability groups. So thank you, John. I'll hand it over to you um, to share your knowledge. Okay, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, what Lee was talking about there is really relevant to the <clears throat> areas that I have been providing advice to people with blood cancers and other um, chronic illnesses for a long time now. Um, because these conditions such as blood cancers and chronic illnesses generally aff afflict people during their working lives <clears throat> and can affect their ability to continue to work, whether that be short, medium or long term, um, and potentially accumulate, leave the workforce prematurely or, and in particular, not accumulate enough superannuation to live off in retirement, which is what the government wants you to do. So you can be in deficit there significantly because your working life can be cut short or you've got a period of time out of work whilst you're having treatment, whether that's a bone marrow transplant, whether it's other forms of treatment, <clears throat> where, you, where you lay low for a period of time and you're out of work. The problem is that for a lot of chronic illnesses, it's only a small proportion of chronic, or of chronic illnesses that are covered by schemes like workers' comp and motor vehicle accident stuff, but a lot of illnesses are not, <clears throat> a lot of conditions are not, and yet people can be out of the workforce for a significant period of time. There, there is support through Centrelink that uh, Lee was talking about and uh, what she said there really resonated. I'm, a, I'm actually the current acting principal at the Centrelink Legal Service in Victoria and we deal with these issues all the time. Um, and Laurie will talk a bit more about that's, uh, those sorts of issues. But uh, we've, uh, we've only got 20 minutes, so I've done sort of a slide thing. I'm not going to go through it, but that will be available to you at the end. So go through that and that can give you some clues. But basically what this is about is just giving you a couple of touchstones to trigger, <laughs> trigger you to get information. Like Lee was saying, get info, get understand what your position is and in particular so you can do some planning because with chronic illnesses that can affect you, maybe not now, but sometime in the future about your ability to work, planning is a really important part of it. So what Lee talked about, for example, was 
Um, make sure if you're changing jobs <laughs> that you have superannuation, you have insurance that goes with it. Amen. That is really important. Okay, so just really briefly, um, superannuation, if you're in the employed workforce, you're covered by super, or you should be. So your employer's got to pay at the moment is 10.5%. The equivalent of 10.5% of your salary into a super fund, the money accumulates over time. When you hit retirement age and not before, usually you get the money paid out to live off in retirement. But in Australia, and it's quite unique to Australia, we have these insurance arrangements within super to cover off scenarios where people's working lives are cut short. So this insurance sort of tops up what, you, what you've saved for your retirement, or if you die prematurely, then it provides, can top up the provision for your surviving dependents. And I'll talk about that if we get time at the end. So insurance is a, is a unique feature of, an Australia, of Australian superannuation, unlike other countries. Um, and it's super important if you've got a chronic illness, much more so than for people who have just got, you know, um, normal life, normal working expectancies. Um, sorry, that's my phone. <laughs> um, it's finished. Um, so insurance in super is a really important feature, right? And it's a really important planning feature to make sure you've got it, that you maintain it, and that, and that you maximize it during your working life. And that includes with the with the super you've got through the current your current employer looking back at super you've had through previous employment that may or may not have already been consolidated over into your into your current fund and also as lee said if you're changing jobs what what super you may have through the new job and again maximizing all that stuff now i could bang on about that for hours so i'm not going to go into it other than to say it's really important you look at these issues if you're working if you've got a blood cancer and you're working at the moment, but you are making decisions around whether you continue work, whether you take time out or whether you reduce your hours of work, before you do it, look at what super you've got and get advice about what super you've got to plan for the future, right? Now, I'll just give you one little example. If you've got insurance in super includes um, income protection, which is monthly payments, usually payable for two years. It includes... TPD, the lump sum for permanent disability. It includes terminal illness benefits if you've got less than two years to live and it includes a death benefit in some combination. Some or all of them are in combination super funds. But one example is if you are working full time, but you are considering cutting back to part time to, to deal with the effects of fatigue or whatever through your, through your chronic illness, you've got to be really careful about doing that because that can affect, in particular, the income protection payment, right? Because the income protection insurance thing is calculated as a percentage, usually calculated as a percentage of your salary when you stop work. So if you go from full-time to part-time and then you stop work, then the income protection could be a percentage of your part-time salary rather than your full-time salary, right? So it's just an example of it's really important to get advice about this stuff, to look at it, to see what's there for you, right? Um, now, just <clears throat> uh, Laurie also, sorry, Lee also talked about um, that they made the decision to access um, uh, Dean's superannuation. Um, I presume he'd reached a point in his life where he was deciding to stop work. They accessed his super, bought a caravan and went drive and went traveling, right? So I gather at that point in time, he made sort of a maybe a health and lifestyle decision to stop work, at least for the short to medium, maybe long term, and to, to, to access your super to help fund that, right? As I say, superannuation is there for your retirement. And there are rules around whether you when you can access that. And the rules are basically that it, depending on what your date of birth is, you've got to, you've got superannuation stays in, locked up in super until you get to at least age 60. Um, now, you can get early access to super on limited grounds. There are a couple of grounds. One is if you've been on Centrelink for 26 consecutive weeks. The other, another one is if you uh, need money to pay, down, pay mortgage, pay mortgage repayments. And the other one is if you've got a permanent incapacity for work, where in, in that case, you can access all of your superannuation, but you will pay some tax on it. One other ground is if you have a terminal illness, which is less than two years to live, you can access all of your super and it's tax free, 
right? So superannuation, if you take it before retirement age is usually taxed, it's concessionally taxed at a lower rate. But if it's eternal illness, less than two years to live, no tax. If it's a permanent incapacity, some tax, but not much, right? Again, before you make these calls, get advice about this stuff to see what's there, see what the tax position is, etc. cetera. So, um, so in, in Dean's case, <laughs> it sounds like he had through, maybe through employment super, he had a superannuation insurance benefit, which included uh, is it the money paid in by his, his or his employer, which is the one that's locked up to retirement age and probably included a, a permanent disability benefit. Um, which is what we call a TPD lump sum, which is paid to you if you are permanently unfit, usually if you're permanently unfit to do the job you're doing or any other suitable work with your skills and experience, right? There are variations on it, but that's sort of, sort of your standard threshold to be eligible for <coughs> your account balance plus the insurance component, right? Now, with chronic illnesses, that can be problematic if, if for no other reason than from the point of view of well, are you permanently unfit for work, right? Because so many chronic illnesses, including blood cancers, it's a bit of a roller coaster ride as to your ability to work or your ability to work full time or part time or you know travel on public transport for an hour or two hours a day to get to and from the city. Although we're not doing less of that these days, um, that sort of stuff. So, are you going to meet the threshold of that? So, Dean had to. It sounded like Dean was making that sort of health and lifestyle decision about whether to stop work and to claim his superannuation, the disability component in his super. That disability component is provided by an insurance company, a life insurance company, whether it's a TAL or a OnePath or, a, or a AMP, all those sorts of mobs, right? They pay, they, the insurance is funded through the money that's in the super fund and the insurer makes a decision about whether you fit the threshold and it's a high bar about whether you're permanently unfit to do your normal job or any of a suitable work. So before you look at making that decision, you've got to make an assessment about what the likelihood of that is, which basic, which is dependent upon the state of your health, your age, because you know the younger you are, the harder those sort of claims are. The uh, your work history, what your skills, transferable skills are, that sort of stuff. So that's the the TPD lump sum one. And it sounds like Dean made made an assessment that he wanted to make the health and lifestyle decision to stop work. He applied for it and it sounds like he got it, in which case he got both benefits together. The other thing is that there is a timing issue in that because if you make the decision to stop work, a TPD lump sum will take a, a significant period of time, usually somewhere between six to 12 months. It ain't quick, right? And then you're going through the hoops to get it. She, Lee said that it was a, a real process to go through. I'm an superannuation lawyer. This is this is my day job doing this stuff. Um, I've run thousands of these claims, helping people with that, with those sorts of um, benefits. They're not they're not easy, right? They are doable though. If you have, if you if you have a chronic illness such as a, a blood cancer and you make a health and lifestyle decision to stop work in the long term, you are a potential candidate for what you've got. And whether that's with your current super, but you might also have old super right you might have a super count that's inactive or sort of lie dormant for a while um, now most in the last couple of years because of government regulations super funds that the old, old super funds have been amalgamated or consolidated so the uh, the most people these days have only got the one fund but <clears throat> that that's only been in the last sort of couple of years before that but many people had a number of super funds. Some people still have them, right? The significance of that is if you've got an old super fund, it still might have ins current insurance with it, right? Still might have insurance rolling through. Um, and if that's the case, you might have more than one claim. It is possible to have more than one claim. And then, for example, if say you're not working now, you've stopped work previously, it's important to go back and check what you had when you stop work because you might, if you had multiple super funds with insur multiple insurance, then you might have multiple claims now. And that's just the TPD lump sum. Then we get to the income protection. Income protection, which is the monthly payment thing in super, is that if you can't do your normal job 
for at least a waiting period of usually about 60 days or 90 days, then you may be eligible for a monthly payment under super. It might be $1,000 a month if you're in a WARE super or HESTA, for example, it might be $3,000 a month. If you're with Vic Super, it might or Sun Super, it might be um, yeah. There all there are thousands of super funds out there. There's a myriad of insurance arrangements. It's a it's a maze, but there but there is a pathway through this stuff to check what's there. And and as I say, <clears throat> before you make the decision to reduce hours or stop work, find out. As Lee said, ask, get advice. So you, at least you know, so that you can make these sort of planning informed decisions. If it's already happened and you've already stopped work, it's don't despair. It's still worthwhile going to check it because you can go back in time, right? Um, I had, I, 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 we just had a claim accepted the other day for a guy who had a chronic illness. He stopped work in 2018. Um, he did not know he was he was applying for the disability support pension and I'm helping him with that. Um, and I said, well, when did you last work? 2018. Okay, were you on the books then? He said, yeah, I was for a short period of time. We went back and checked. He had super through his employment only for a short period, only a small account balance, but he had insurance in it that paid a monthly benefit of four and a half thousand dollars a month. Um, in his case, it was incredibly generous. It was to age 65, and he's in his mid-30s. Um, he also had a TPD lump sum in there of 700,000 uh, bucks. And I said, well, we can make claims for those. He said, oh, really? <laughs> okay. So the income protection claim has just been accepted, and he's going to be back paid because they're pay back paying him all the way back to 2018. He's going to be back paid over, over 200,000 bucks. Now, there is... And then, and then the TPD claim follows. Now, with the income protection, and this this is sort of, sort of one other piece that I want to just quickly touch on before we before I finish, and that is the relationship between superannuation and Centrelink, right? So a lot of people's support income support will come through Centrelink, and if you're on say the disability support pension or job seeker, how do things like superannuation affect that? In this guy's case. Right, he's going to get back paid his income protection payments for four years, but he's been on job seeker the whole time. So there is a repayment of Centrelink for that, and it will create an ongoing suspension period. Now, the cost to him is he will lose his um, uh, uh, healthcare card, but the income protection rate, which is about a thousand bucks a week, is miles above what the job seeker rate, which is 300 bucks a week. Um, so, anyway, but there are, there are different permutations and combinations in this, and I'm sorry to bang on about it, but it's just really important to, if you are, if you are working at the moment, or if you're considering stopping work, or even if you have stopped work, to, 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 to get advice around what superannuation you've got now, what superannuation you've had in the past, what insurance arrange, what insurance you had, to see whether you're a candidate for some or all of these things, right? The same goes for a terminal illness benefit, right? So some blood cancers, unfortunately, people have limited, can have limited um, life expectancies. Um, in um, Dean's case, he passed away after a long period of time, but at some point along the track, he would have had, he may well have had a diagnosis of having less than two years to live. At that point, if he was still working, or even if he had stopped working, he, and he was covered for the terminal illness insurance benefit in his super, he could have be a, he may be accounted for that, right? Over and above the account balance in his super. Again, just check, right? Um, where, whether you're still working, whether you're considering reducing your hours, also changing jobs, you know? I mean, nobody, you know, a lot of people, what the average time people stay in a job is, I think it's, it's reduced, it's about, about three or four years now is the average time frame. So you may well be moving from one job to another you can usually take your superannuation with you from one job to another. And in fact, there's sort of a default arrangement now where that happens. But there are some super funds that you wouldn't want to leave um, <laughs> if you could avoid it. They include, for example, these generous government schemes, right? So federal and state government 
schemes, what they call what we call defined benefit schemes, have been kicking around for years. A lot of them have been closed off now to new members. But if you've been in the public service, federal or state, or uh, other um, utility, uh, state and federal utilities, you may be covered by these schemes that are very generous. And before you make any decision to leave that that sort of a job to go and to go do something else, it's really important to find out what the potential consequence of that can be. It doesn't mean you don't do it, but you just do it with your eyes open, right? So look into that, all right? Um, I'm running out of time. I'm not going to be able to say that much more. One, one issue I will mention, and uh, it wasn't covered off in what Lee said, but it is, it's, sort of a, it's sort of an adjunct to the wills issue. And that is in superannuation, um, if, you, when you, if you pass away, your superannuation is paid to your dependents, surviving dependents or your estate or a combination of them. Uh, but who it goes to is usually a matter for the trustees of the super fund to decide. They decide who were your dependents at the date of death, whether it's a spouse, de facto, children, fi financial dependent, someone in a sort of an interdependent relationship with you, uh, or your estate, or a combination of those. Now, a lot of people uh, live in, bl have blended relationships, have got ex-partners, current partners, or siblings, or whatever, um, and they want to make provision for them, or they want certainty around who is going to get their superannuation. If you want certainty, most super funds, as I say, the discretion is with the trustee as to who gets what. Right? It is challengeable, but there is a discretion there. But if you want the certainty, most super funds have a thing called binding nominations, where you can set out in, in the form of sort of, you, you do it like you do a will, which is you nominate someone someone or, or a combination of people to get your superannuation if you pass away and the trustees are bound by that decision you make by that nomination you make so say for example you say i want my um uh, current partner to get 50 percent of my money and i want my two dependent ch my two children to get 25 percent each the trustee has to abide by that so long as it's a valid nomination. But if you don't nominate, the trustee will make the decision as to who gets what, right? Now, it, but if you want that certainty, take up the binding nomination option if it's got if it's there. Most super funds have it. You can look at it online and, and you can do it. The way you do is you fill it in like a will. You, not, you nominate the people. It's got to be signed off by you in front of witnesses, okay? But there is this one note of warning there. And we're starting to see this only sort of recently in the last couple of years, there are a couple of super funds that are introducing um, uh, something that I think is pretty insidious. It's called non-lapsing nominations, death benefit nominations, which basically means when you nominate someone to be your, to get your super, uh, subject to some um, restrictions, you can't change it. Even if your circumstances change, you can't change it. You're stuck with it. Um, so, uh, just a note of warning about whether your super fund has, whether, whether you, what you sign up for is a binding nomination as opposed to a non-lapsing nomination. Um, the difference between the two is with a binding nomination, you nominate the person, the trustee pays it to that person or persons. You cannot alternatively nominate your estate. So for example, say you want um, the Leukemia Foundation to get some money um, or you nominate the Lost Dogs Home uh, to get some of the money. You can't nominate them directly because they are not a dependent of yours. But what you can do is you can nominate your estate and then have a will and make provision for them in the will. That's how you get the money from superannuation to those entities, right? But as I say, if you have, uh, if your fund has a la non-lapsing nomination, or sorry, with a binding nomination, every three years you have to renew that nomination. Otherwise it lapses. But with these non-lapsing ones, it don't lapse. It stays, even if your circumstances change. There are some variations on that, but it's, it's something to look out for. So as I say, as part of what Lee was saying, which was make sure you've got a will, make sure that's in order. Also look at what your superannuation death benefit nominations are, right? It comes up on your statement every year when you get the statement. It says what you, who your nominees are. 
if it's if it's non-binding, it is what it says. If you want the certainty, then apply for a binding nomination, right? But and if you've got any doubts around that, again, get advice. Okay. So I don't know how are we going for time. <laughs> are we all right? Okay. So well, um, a couple more things. So if the the interaction between superannuation and Centrelink. I was sort of briefly touched on before. Um, if, if you get a superannuation payout, it counts towards the Centrelink income, uh, sorry, assets test, right? Whilst money stays in the superannuation system, it's exempt from the assets test. But if you take it out of superannuation and, and then use it, it then counts towards the Centrelink assets test. Um, whereas the income protection payments I've been talking about, the monthly payments, if you apply for them and get them, they count towards the Centrelink income test. And there is a formula. It's usually sort of, 50, it's, it's some, it equates to something like 50 cents in the dollar is a, re, is a reduction. So if you have got, if you're working and you're considering stopping work <coughs> and you've got income protection and TPD cover through your superannuation, and you might be eligible for Centrelink payments, or if you've already previously stopped work and you're on Centrelink payments and you've discovered that you've got this income protection you should claim, you've got to go through a process of deciding, well, is it worth my while applying for the income protection? Because what will it do to my Centrelink payments, right? Particularly if you've got the disability support pension, because that's quite valuable. So you need to do an assessment, you do need to do the calculations you need to run the figures basically to see whether it's worth your while to apply for it. That's sort of relevant um, when you've got income protection through your super that's around about the thousand fifteen hundred dollars a month. But if you've got which is sort of like your Hester's and your Aware Supers and those sorts of things, but if you've got um, in income protection through super at at a higher rate, which is like three grand a month or four grand a month or five grand a month or something beyond that, then uh, it's it's usually worth your while to do it. Such as the fellow that I talked about, where his payments were four and a half grand a month, it was his it was in his interest to do it. All right, so um, I think we sort of covered off a lot of what I wanted to cover off, which is to sort of just impress on you that there are. The financial support is a really important thing. If you've got a chronic illness, number one, you've got to, you're concentrating on, you've got enough on your plate to deal with your health problems, how it, you know, the impacts on your family and your friends, etc. Is financial support is really important to keep your to keep your life running as smoothly as possible. With chronic illnesses such as blood cancers, it's it's more the exception, not the rule that you that, that income support can come through state super state um, uh, compensation schemes, etc. What you're what you're left with, or what your fallback position is, Centrelink benefits, whether that's a disability support pension or job seeker, or superannuation, whether that's uh, through income protection through TPD, or if you've got private insurance, private income protection. Say you're self-employed and you've got your own policy. It's those sort of things that are really important. Now, the problem is, as I say, that the, your entitlement to those can vary. What you've got, what you're covered for can vary and the entitlement to it can change um, over time, right? Uh, and indeed, with most superannuation funds where stuff gets really complicated is that the insurance arrangements can change and often do with super funds every three years, right? So it's a real, you've got to, you got to run with a herd as it as it happens. So, therefore, just keep in the back of your mind. If, if you get nothing out of this other than a really important something, I have to think of and look at. If I'm looking at what my planning ahead, what I'm going to do, whether I'm going to stop work or reduce hours, or if I've already stopped work, what what am I going to do with Centrelink? What am I going to do elsewhere? Look at your super. Look at what you've got. Um, look at and and use that as a tool to plan ahead. Take that into account in what your planning is going to be. Um, and uh, I'm a superannuation lawyer. I'm, this is what I do every day. So there, we've put a, I put the slides together to give you a bit more, put a little bit more flesh on the bones there. But um, if you've got any questions anytime, 
just let me know. I'll answer your question. Doesn't cost you anything for me to do that anytime you will like um, to tell you what, what it is is there and what it is you might be able to do at some stage in the future. All right. I think I've talked enough. I'll shut up now. <laughs> That was fabulous, John. No, thank you so much for joining us today. You're such a knowledgeable man, and I'm sure that everyone here listening to this presentation will look forward to looking at your notes and um, taking into consideration all of the valuable things that you've shared with us in this time. So thank you. Um, our next speaker is, um, is Laurie Hobbs. So um, I'd like to welcome Laurie. Um, she's going to you know, pick up some of the other issues that Lee raised um, and share her perspective. Um, uh, Laurie has had over 25 years experience as a social worker. She has worked in Australia, England and Ireland in both community and acute health care settings. Uh, she has spent the last 15 years working in cancer services, including oncology, haematology and bone marrow transplants units at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. She supports both patients and their families with their psychosocial needs during treatment by exploring the emotional, financial and practical implications following a diagnosis. So um, welcome, Laurie. Well, thanks, Marianne. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, I've got a bit of a simple slideshow just to help keep me on track. Um, and forgive me if I'm looking at it for notes to just elaborate um, points. So thank you, Jenny, for putting the slides up. Um, if you want to click this one, that'd be great. Um, so I think, as Mary Ann said in the introduction, is that often it's when we have um, a medical issue that we find the, the motivation to get our legal and our financial affairs in order. Um, and I, I think for the, a lot of the patients that I work with, when these things are stable, um, it kind of brings peace of mind and allows people to divert energy to sort of focusing on the, the emotional impacts of the, the diagnosis and the treatment. Um, as John so thoroughly outlined, there's, you know, a whole world of income protection and insurances, um, but for some people that might not be available to them at all or at that point in time. And so that's often when people um, need to explore Centrelink options. I think Lee pointed out quite clearly that it can be a very confusing and complex system to navigate. Um, and trying to do this when you're unwell or stressed is, is not the best time. Um, but it's often when we need it the most. And I sort of, I just often are there supporting and encouraging people to push through um, to try and get an outcome that will, you know, be a, a benefit to them in the long term. Um, social workers are there to support people through these processes, guide them. They're not financial advisors, they're not employed by Centrelink or able to, you know, determine the eligibility. Um, but we, I suppose, are, help, are there to help navigate the system. And um, it can often be very important to sort of, you can authorise a family member or a friend to be a nominate, nominee for you who can actually deal with Centrelink um, on your behalf. So that can be quite good. So I'm just going to talk about four main payments that are probably relevant in this setting. Um, job seeker is as you can see, for people who in these circumstances aren't able to work due to an illness or perhaps study. And uh, they use the term short term, which generally is under two years temporary. Um, like all payments with Centrelink, you need to meet um, residency income and asset tests. And these are assessed as a single, or if you're part of a couple, it looks at both income and assets there. You'll need medical certificates from the treating doctor explaining you about your illness, which would exempt you from the job seeking and training requirements normally that apply to this. They're called mutual obligations. Um, these will often exempt you for three months at a time. Um, and sometimes, depending on your illness, you might be exempt for longer periods. It does require people to do a, a fortnightly re, um, reporting to see if you or your partner have had any income during this time. So it it's, can be a process to get on it, and then there are ongoing obligations but most of them being sort of exempt if you've got medical certificates. 
explaining your um, circumstances. Um, as I've included there, the payment's quite low. Um, so this is often what you hear about in the media about people struggling to sort of um, make ends meet on this payment. What a lot of people uh, look for when they get a diagnosis of, a, of blood cancer um, is whether the disability support pension uh, might be an option for them. I've had many a patient say I've, I've called Centrelink and explained that I've got cancer and been told that I should get a disability support pension. That would be great, but I often sort of say there's the criteria that they talk about has a few more caveats that we might need to explore there. Um, as, as I've said there, the financial help if you have a permanent, so greater than two year condition, that will stop you from working and they determine that at least 15 hours a week. The main issue, like everything else, sorry, you need to meet residency income and asset um, eligibility. Um, but the key points that, that I think need to be focused on is, as I said, the condition will last more than two years. And this is the key point, that it is fully diagnosed, treated and stabilised. So for many people, that's one of the barriers to getting on disability support pension. Um, the diagnosis is usually clear. Um, the treatment itself for many people can take, you know, years over 12 months, sometimes greater, and you obviously don't know what that's going to be at the start. And the stabilisation for a lot of people will only happen when they've had the treatment or it may fluctuate. So there's lots of barriers that go on to accessing a disability support pension. I have had some luck with patients being able to argue that the treatment required for their fully diagnosed condition will take over two years to get stabilised. And during that time, they're unable to work, um, but they've been few and far between. Um, as you can see, the, the fortnightly payment is significantly more to the job seeker, which is why we want as many people to can get on them as possible. Um, John, I'm actually going to direct um, people to this wonderful thing called a disability toolkit that can be found on Social Security Rights Victoria, which is a guide for doctors, health professionals, carers and patients, um, which John has actually is a person responsible for it. So I'll give you a little plug there, John. And it's the simplest form I've seen. It, it covers all um, things called an impairment table. So one of the other conditions of getting on a disability support pension is that you must impairment rating of 20 points or more. It's probably too complex to go into that now. I'm familiar with it and I find it too complex, but in this disability toolkit, it actually breaks down what the impairments are and helps people work out if you would fit the category for mild, moderate or severe. So that's been one of the greatest tools um, I've seen for people. I, I would like to get more people, say I get I support people to get onto disability support pensions. Um, I find it's a challenge for people who are diagnosed with illnesses, which makes sense because they're at the beginning of their treatment. And for most people, we've got curative intent. So there's you know logic in not wanting to get someone onto a permanent payment if there is a goal of their, their condition improving. I just think that a lot of people think um, short-term versus long-term in Centrelink that is perhaps different to what it is if you're living that every day. So they're the two main payments that are usually relevant for patients. And now moving on to payments that might be accessible for the carers. Um, the carer payment or carer pension is if you, uh, an income support payment paid to carers who because of the demands of their caring role are unable to support themselves through paid employment. Their full-time job is being a carer. Um, by full-time or you know, constant care, they usually say that, that you're providing care for a significant period each day, the equivalent of a normal working day. So I would say greater than eight hours. Obviously you need to meet, meet residency income and assets tests. And this 
does sometimes apply to both the carer and the care recipient. So there are possibilities that go to both sides. The care recipient needs to score high enough on a what's called an adult disability assessment determination table, ADAT, um, or have a terminal illness. Uh, that's a, a report that gets completed by medical staff or can be done by nurses and occupational therapists. Um, my tip, if you're ever getting someone to complete the medical report to support an application for carer payments, is to ask that they write it down both based on your worst days. So one of the questions, for instance, is can you walk upstairs? And I would ask, on your weakest days, could you do a flight of stairs? That's perhaps the way to approach it. It does say at the front of the medical report, you may need to look at a person's care needs or function over an extended period to accurately um, capture their needs. So I would encourage that. I know sometimes doctors want to put the best scenario. I'm often saying for the purposes of Centrelink, you want to encourage, let's put down the worst case scenario to try and get you the better financial outcome, if it's truthful and within the realms. <laughs> you know, for it looking at either end, that's a good tip there. Um, the care payment is that for someone who must need constant care in their home, your home or in hospital. Um, I believe a, a few months ago, it changed that they didn't start uh, recognising the care you were providing until a patient came home. And so short stints in hospital are okay, but they often, if someone's diagnosed in hospital and has a lengthy um, stint of months in hospital, Centrelink used to recognise that and ask the question, do you provide this daily support in hospital? But I think now they, they imply that they won't actually start that until they've, um, and then keep it going through short admissions. So again, always needing to look at the fine print there. There is another payment people may have heard of called the carer allowance. Um, this is, I suppose, like a little bonus payment. Uh, it's only 136, I think, at the moment, dollars a fortnight. Um, that can be a paid in addition to other payments. So you could get it in addition to the carer payment, or some people get this on their own because they might have another income source to support them. It's called an income supplement for people who provide additional daily care and attention. Um, so it's a little bit of a lower threshold than the um, significant care you're providing with the carer payment. There is residency and the income test, but there is no asset test. Test is fairly generous in this case here. Um, and as I said, it, it can be very handy to get, as I say to people that might cover the petrol, I used to say for a week, Maybe not so much with the current. Mm -hmm. So, but any every little bit helps. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide now, please, Jenny. It's just a, a collection of things that I thought might be helpful uh, to reduce the, the hidden costs. Um, just help ease some of the financial pressure. Um, healthcare cards. Uh, concession cards um, are provided to people who are on Centrelink benefits, so job seeker, carer, pensions, um, disability pensions, not if you're on the carer allowance for adults. Um, it's not related to your healthcare issues, despite its name. Um, it's actually an, an income and asset test. So you don't get it because you've got a healthcare need, you get it because you meet the financial threshold there. If you're not receiving a payment from Centrelink, you can test eligibility for the low income healthcare card, standalone um, card there. That can be very handy for people who might not be able to get Centrelink payments, residing, residency issues, perhaps being in New Zealand residents, and they might be able to get the low income healthcare card. Um, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, PBS, uh, is 
a, a system that reduces or caps the cost of listed medications. Um, these relate to when people get scripts and not the actual chemotherapy in the hospital that's covered by a, a relationship with Medicare. Talking about my area here, I'm more relating to the scripts that you'd get through your local pharmacist or your, your hospital pharmacy. Um, important thing to know with that is that there is a, a safety net threshold. And so that once you reach that cap, that means that your payments will reduce. So I think as of the 1st of July, the thresholds have just been lowered that if you're a, a general patient without a healthcare card, once you or your family combined reaches $1,457.10 in a calendar year, you will then revert to the concession rate for all your PBS medications, which is capped as at $6 a script. And I think other ones are around the $40 mark. They've just changed them. So if you are a concession card holder, and in a calendar year, you have reached your cap of $244.80. Scripts thereafter on PBS uh, at zero cost you. So that's a very important um, thing to, to know about. You can, the best thing to do is ask your pharmacist. They can actually um, print off late all the PBS medications that have been dispensed for you and your family and help you register to get um, that that safety net threshold. So that could have a huge impact on reducing. Um, another thing to mention is the state's travel and accommodation schemes. Um, this is partial reimbursement um, for travel and accommodation costs, generally for people who live over 100 kilometres away from where they need to go to have their specialist treatment. Every state's very different. Um, I'm naturally familiar with the Victorian scheme. A quick example is that you can get 21 cents per kilometre reimbursed um, and around $50 per night for a carer and a patient if you've had to stay uh, in accommodation. Um, the, the Tasmania program is much more generous than that, as, as is, I think, every other state. <laughs> um, and a lot of charities like the Leukemia Foundation, they bulk bill their any accommodation um, and get the reimbursement themselves. So it's a very valuable scheme. As I said, for mostly it's for people who live over 100 kilometres away, or sometimes there's a threshold that if you travel over a certain amount of kilometres in a week. So very important to check that out for each. You will probably need to keep receipts for um, any accommodation costs, any public transport, flights, generally don't need to keep it for petrol receipts, um, but if in doubt, keep a receipt. Um, it doesn't generally cover any parking costs um, and it doesn't, usually, it doesn't cover meals or anything like that. May cover some taxi fares if you've had a flight to and from the airport to the hospital. Um, okay, the next point is parking concessions. Um, exactly what Lee said, ask always good to ask if your health provider has any parking concessions. Generally, they'll exist for uh, healthcare concession card holders, um, but often for frequent or long stay patients that might be available. To um, another thing to ask about is any hardship provisions or grants that might be available uh, through uh, utility providers, mortgage providers, your telcos, your bank, your credit cards. I've had many a patients ring up about their credit card and been told, oh, you actually have an insurance attached to this, we will pay it for you. So, you know, these are questions that you, it's a very simple thing to ask. Often find these bigger companies have very well established hardship provisions. Um, and so it's a really good thing to explore. Um, utility providers, in most states have an established utility grant system or a hard, hardship system. Um, the Victorian one, for instance, can you can get $650 per utility grant um, if you meet eligibility criteria. 
even if you don't, the best thing is to sort of speak to people before you find you're getting into financial debt or distress, and they'll usually help set up payment plans. Um, a lot of people, I think, panic about the mortgage, but my experience has been that there's often a lot more scope to, to uh, explore options and reduce payments or interest only and things. Obviously, you need to go through and do due diligence with what's the ramifications of this and make sure you're not making any short term. And this is where, you know, this might be necessary. Again, all the things I'm suggesting are to explore, not, not whether they'll be the right match for your circumstances. Um, another thing that I'm surprised that a lot of people don't have is ambulance membership. Again, I know each state is is different and so um, explore what how you get that whether it's included or it's something you need to healthcare card holders will automatically be covered for ambulance so you don't need to double up some private health insurance will have that but i'd strongly recommend people explore any limitations to that they rarely include um, patient transport the non-emergency ambulance Again, that might be a vital service for some people who need to come into hospital treatment. If they can get, you know, a transport that they don't have to pay to and it's safe and secure, um, but they need to check whether their ambulance cover has that eligibility. How am I going for time? Doing all right. So oh, we're going to move on to my next talk. Uh, this is about alternate decision makers. Um, I've written a fair bit down, so I'll, I'll try not to double up on what I'm saying. But again, each state has a different term for this role. Uh, Queensland refer to them as enduring power of attorney, Victoria and medical treatment decision makers. In a nutshell, this person can become your substitute decision maker if you're no longer able to make decisions. Um, it's really important to identify in your family who would be the person that the medical team would talk to if they were unable to talk to you for a period. That person um, must make decisions they reasonably believe is the decision the patient themselves would have made if they were able to do it. And it's important to remember that this person doesn't have the, the ability or the responsibility to make a medical decision. Um, they're there to be the person the doctors communicate with as they would with the patient in normal circumstances. You can appoint someone um, to this role, someone that you trust and that you think you're going to have an ongoing relationship with, um, or your state may have a, a flow chart or a hierarchy that can be guided if there are no appointments. So again, to refer to my, to my area of knowledge in Victoria, there is a hierarchy. Is, is your patient unable to consent? Is there anyone who can act as a substitute? Um, is there an appointment? And if there's not, you go down a list of, do they have a partner? Do they have a carer? Do they have a sibling, adult or child? I've got the order mucked up there. And as long as there are people in those roles who you have close and continuing relationships, um, they can act in that role. Even me just explaining it, you can see if, 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 if you've appointed someone, it makes it a lot simpler. So they're probably conversations that's important. I think everyone should have um, that if this circumstance came along, who would I want the medical staff to liaise with as my sort of substitute decision maker? Um, this flows into a more formal process known as advanced care planning. This refers to both the discussions um, and the possible document documentation of your healthcare preferences. Um, it may result in the appointment or the identification of the alternate decision maker, and it may extend to actually writing down what's called an advanced care directive. An advanced care directive, sometimes referred to as a living will, and it's something you create for yourself and involves documenting your preferences for future care. It's also a guide that can be there for that substitute 
decision maker to help guide them in that role. Um, if you do an advanced care directive, it is a legally binding document and the preferences for your health care that are documented in that must be followed um, by medical people. So it's your voice um, to make sure your uh, life goals, preferred outcomes, values, and the direction about your health care and treatments um, are followed. I, I personally think that the, the conversations are as as important, if, if not sometimes more important documentation. I think it can be very difficult to document everything, to cover every scenario, you know, life changes, things change. If you're having ongoing conversations with your partner or your family or the people that support you, and they know what's important to you and your wishes, that will hopefully give you peace of mind that if anyone is ever having to step in and do that sort of advocacy role for you, that you've given them all the information that they need to do that, but you're also reassured that your wishes and your values um, will be reflected on. You know, goal. Um, I think I'm at the end of my, my time now. So I just sort of wanted to conclude um, with just saying that I, I often get asked about you know, is this a challenging area to work in? Um, and it can be, but I, I always like to sort of point out that it's equally rewarding um, and inspiring. And I once heard a doctor say that people are often at their best when they're going through their worst. And that's certainly something that I'm privileged to see every day. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, and I hope it's been helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. And what a beautiful quote from a doctor, because I too can say that um, I've learnt so much from people I've met on this journey um, who have given me the opportunity to meet um, specialists like yourself, Laurie and, Laurie and John, um, such valuable contributions to today and certainly um, information that can people can walk away with with some you know informed decision making and um, certainly opportunities to um, good messages ask the question reach out for support and um, seek some seek some guidance uh, now I'm going to pass the microphone over to my colleague Jane Anderson who's going to lead um, the Q&A we've received over uh, 50 questions prior to the seminar and uh, they all have a common theme and I think the biggest one was, and John, you might be able to answer this for people, is how can one access low cost or free financial and legal advice? You're on mute, John, sorry. Sorry, I can answer the legal part of it. Um, uh, <clears throat> the lawyers will charge you um, but there are some of us who will do a lot of work um, for free. Um, so, for example, in the area that I work in, um, where I'm telling you it's really important to get advice <clears throat> about what you're covered for, what you're not covered for, and looking at planning ahead, um, <clears throat> there are lawyers such as, our, such as myself who will do that for free. Um, so... I'm happy to do it. So I'm happy to look at anybody's documents, answer anybody's questions about what they're covered for, what their options are, the way, a pathway forward for them for nothing. Um, and then if you've got people who are legally representing you in claims or disputes, then it's, I think it's really important to get someone who's prepared to do it <coughs> on a no win, no fee basis rather than a pay by the hour basis because that's a real, you know, the clock's up. So that's how we operate. But, um, and, you know, if one of the beauties of superannuation insurance stuff is that it's national. So all the schemes can, you can cover it wherever you are about, about what the issues are, what the funds say. With Centrelink, there are community, there's community, there's a big community legal sector out there. Uh, with Centrelink, in each state, they have, a Centrelink legal service, Basic Rights Queensland, Welfare Rights New South Wales, uh, Welfare Rights WA. Uh, there's uh, an organisation in South Australia, I think it's through the United Care. 
um, and in Victoria, it's Social Security Rights Victoria and Tasmania. So there are community sectors that will provide you with free advice and assistance, where on a, although it's on a on a limited basis um, for Centrelink issues. Right, financial advice. There is an organisation called the National Debt Helpline. They are unbelievable. They are brilliant. Um, National Debt Helpline. Remember that name. They are a telephone advice service. They provide free advice to folk <coughs> on uh, debt issues, but financial issues, consumer issues. They're brilliant. They're really good. I should say that I'm on the board of the Consumer Action Law Centre, which is the overseer of the National Debt Helpline in Victoria, at least. So yeah. So there are look, there are options out there, but if you get if you're getting legal advice, just make sure you find out what they're going to charge you. And for financial advice, look, there are independent people out there who will give you financial advice. Sometimes it's tied to organisations, so you just got to look for independent organisations. But the National Debt Helpline can give you a list of names. All right. Excellent advice, John. And I think just having those links that people can go to, rather than searching it for themselves. Um, when you're time poor, not feeling well with a blood cancer, your care is going from home to hospital, running in between to get groceries and medicines. All of these things take time. And I think that, you know, Lee um, spoke to this about asking for help. And I think just ask is, you know, the key um, thing to take home today. Along with the advice on Centrelink and superannuation, is, is there importance in, you know, asking for advice around the tax uh, taxation implications that come <clears throat> with this? Yeah, there is. Uh, it's a bit of a maze, but there are sort of, I mean, I'm not a tax lawyer, so I can't give you independent, I can't give you tax advice in every situation. I can just tell you that if you access super, <coughs> there are various thresholds at which tax is payable or not payable. So as I said before, if you access your superannuation on grounds of terminal illness, which is less than two years to live, it's tax free. If you access it after age retirement age, it's tax free. If you access, access it on grounds of permanent incapacity, it is taxed, but very small amount. Otherwise, it's concessionally taxed at 20% plus the, the Medicare levy. Yeah, but it is important to get if you're looking at retiring, speaking to an advisor about what, what your options are and what the tax implications can be, yes. Excellent, thanks, John. I think that's really good advice for everyone. And of course, we'll be um, sending out um, handouts with the referencing to all of these places to everyone who registered for the webinar today. Um, I think one of the uh, interesting questions that was also quite a common theme that came through in, the, in um, the thread prior to the webinar was advice about applying for insurance policies, loans, or health or travel insurance once you have a pre-existing condition. Uh, I suppose that's me again. <coughs> um, yeah, John, sorry. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> um, if you are applying for life insurance or disability insurance, if you're applying individually, you'll get screened for pre-existing conditions or you'll get screened out if you've got a pre-existing condition. Um, but there are ways and means of getting it without being screened out. The main vehicle for that is through superannuation, insurance through super. Because under most super funds, if you join a super fund, if you join an employer and you join a super fund, uh, within six months of starting work, then you'll get cover on what they call a, 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 a default amount of cover on what's called an automatic acceptance basis, which no, with no individual health screening. So if you've got blood cancer already, or you've got a chronic illness, you can actually get insurance cover, including for that condition, if you through in, with using employment super as your vehicle, right? Um, uh, sometimes if you're if you're if you're in a group scheme, say if you belong, if you join up to an employer that's got um, an employment income protection scheme, you can get covered that way. Um, travel insurance, that's a whole nother world. <laughs> I think that's another seminar, but travel insurance is it's fraught, but it is possible to get it even if you've got a pre-existing condition. 
there are ways and means. But I think I, we were talking about this before, and I think we need to run a, a session on travel and what, how you travel with a chronic illness and get travel insurance and the whole box and dice. Yeah. And, and John, I agree with you. I think that that, you know, needs more time than we have today. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a question that we get asked as blood cancer support coordinators all the time. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking for things to add to our webinars for topics uh, for discussion. So I think we will move on and, and use that next time. Um, I think, Laurie, you covered um, all of those extra financial supports that are out there. I just wanted to, you know, and you were very good in, in referencing that every state is different. Um, I just wondered if you might be able to talk about um, not-for-profits who could perhaps offer financial assistance and how to access them. Um, and a lot of people are asking about, you know, what costs might they incur that's not covered under Medicare with their treatment? Uh, there's a few questions there. Um, so the, the costs often, one of the biggest costs is parking and, and actually accessing. Um, so as I said, uh, trying to find out perhaps if there are concession rates. Um, sometimes even like getting a disabled parking permit through your local scheme, again, it changes everywhere. That might uh, give you some discount or some extended parking that might be cheaper because you can stay there longer. Um, so that's uh, a situation. Sorry, if you could, were there some other points there, Jane? So uh, one of the things around parking and transport, I think, is that there are schemes that are out there and our transport team at the Leukemia Foundation uh, are certainly offering people assistance with Uber or fuel vouchers. Uh, we've also encouraged them to help people with uh, disability parking permits mm -hmm. and also to connect them with community transport schemes as well. Uh, so I think it's about that asking and every state is different, but the Leukemia Foundation offers those services statewide and, and knows what's available. So if anyone is wanting assistance with that, they could reach out to us. The and other in addition, sorry, Jane, yes. And then addition, the Cancer Council is, is also a good overall, you know, to see if they can link you into specific things. I know in some regional areas, they have specific cancer support areas that lots of patients have got help with petrol, um, sometimes transport. I've seen even house cleaning funded for some people. There's so many unique, and I think when we were saying before, ask the question, just to point out, asking that question to other um, patients and families going through it can sometimes get you more information than perhaps the, the professionals, because the word of mouth is a very valuable, valuable tool. And as I said, sometimes that's where I learn of something and I go and explore that there. And just going back one point that the Cancer Council may have some access to pro bono support, financial um, advisors and legal support. So check out whether your state has a program, a waiting list, what the eligibility is, but that can be a way that people can get free financial and legal advice. And if you don't meet the eligibility, they can often refer on to someone that you might be able to explore those, um, you know, fee or low fee options that John was mentioning um, for. But yes, a lots of the, uh, the not-for-profit, it's, it's sort of seeing if there's one that covers the region that you're in. Thanks, Laurie. I, you know, I think it, it all comes back to the beginning where Lee was saying, just ask. And uh, there's a wealth of knowledge, you know, in this panel today, but uh, the Leukemia Foundation has this knowledge across Australia, uh, where all consumers can reach out to the blood cancer support coordinators. Uh, the social workers in treating centres, John's given some great tips on how to get help with all of the areas that he covered. 
Thanks, Jane. Um, I think it has been a wonderful afternoon. Um, John and Laurie, thank you again um, for joining us here this afternoon. Um, it's always um, a good opportunity for us to connect with all of our blood cancer patients and their carers throughout Australia to, um, you know, to share knowledge uh, to also make them aware that we are here for them. We can be that advocate. We can ask the question if they're a little bit frightened about uh, um, reaching out to ask the question themselves. Um, there has been an incredible amount of information provided today from our excellent guest speakers, um, but this does uh, draw today's session to a close. From me, goodbye and all the very best. Take care and um, thank you for joining us. <laughs>